Yeah, go ahead. I knew you came to see me. Thank you. Um, how's everyone doing tonight? Thank you for being here. That's right. We normally shush you in the library, but tonight, please yell as much as you like. God bless you. Um, let's also say hello to everyone who's watching online. We got a lot of people watching on the live stream, so whether you're here in the room or online, thank you very much for being with us. Uh, my name's Aiden. I'm part of the team from Live from NYPL that brings all these events, so I am thoroughly delighted to see this very packed house. And of course, we're here for Mark Marin and Clis Cliff Nestroff and Cliff's new book, Outrageous, A History of Showbiz and the Culture Wars. Yeah, give it up. Um, this is, for me, this is great. I first learned about Cliff's work listening to Mark's show, I don't know, a decade or so ago when his first book, The Comedians, came out. So when we found out that Mark could come out and talk to Cliff about it, we just couldn't be more delighted and super grateful that he made the trip out here. Um, Outrageous, if you haven't read it yet, is absolutely fantastic. Um, it makes the very convincing case that anyone who thinks that we live in an unprecedented era of cancel culture, um, extreme sensitivity about what public figures can and can't say, just don't know anything about history. Um, and Cliff's book fills in that history and shows that for you know 200 or so years, Americans have been in some kind of culture war or another and always arguing about what's acceptable to say in public. Um, and if you haven't read it, you don't have it yet, you can pick it up right over there after the event. Please get a copy if you can. Cliff will be signing copies of the book uh, right over here after the event. And of course, everyone here has the library card, yeah? I'm gonna hold you to that. Um, you can check it out with your library card as well as all of Cliff's other books, Mark's books. Um, Cliff also recommended a bunch of fantastic reading, which you have in the printed programs. All of those you can get at the library on our app, Simply E, however you like to read. Um, we encourage reading. So, you know, arguments about free expression, censorship, um, are on our mind big time these days at the library, um, specifically the ever-growing and horrific wave of book bannings that are happening all over this country, um, mostly in Texas and Florida. Um, and last year, we saw the highest number of uh, book ban attempts since people have been keeping records. Um, and the data for this year shows that 2023 is going to be even worse than the year before. Um, and of course, the majority of books that are challenge or banned feature people of color, um, LGBTQ plus people, and of course, the books are all for kids, so it's, it's horrific. Um, I would encourage you to go to our website and go to nypl.org slash books for all, where you can learn about our campaign that we're waging with the American Library Association and libraries across the country to take a stand. Um, there's all kinds of things. There are teen banned book clubs. We have access to banned books for people across the country on our app, Simply E, and a whole lot more. So that's, again, nypl.org slash books for all. Uh, Life from NYPL is winding down uh, for the year but we have a couple of events left, and speaking of uh, banned books, on uh, Friday, December 15th, we have one of our favorite events of the year, the Library After Hours, which if you haven't been, please come. We take over this whole building on Fridays after it closes down, and we have experiences all throughout the building that are all around a theme. This one's gonna be about censorship. So we're gonna have display of rare materials uh, that have been banned throughout history, uh, rare books, photographs, artwork, so on. Uh, curated films about the history of censorship and also adaptations of uh, books that have been banned in the past, you know, like In the Night Kitchen, things like that. Um, side note, did you know that Frog and Toad was once banned because they thought that Frog and Toad were too lazy? <laughs> that is true. Also, Strega Nona for witchcraft. Okay, so let's bring up Cliff and Mark in one second. Let me just tell you that you have note cards on your seats. Those are for asking questions. Um, they'll be glad to answer some of them at the end. Just write them down and some of my colleagues will collect them. Um, I encourage you to phrase your questions in the form of questions, please. Um, and lastly, Live from NYPL is made possible by the continuing generosity of Celeste Bartos, Manaz Ispahani Bartos, and Adam Bartos, and of course by everyone who's here. So thank you again so much for being here. Let's give it up for Mark Marin and Cliff Nestroff. All right. Hey, everybody. That was a very abrupt intro. I didn't know what was happening. Did you? I wasn't listening. What did that uh, guy say? Uh, welcome, folks. Uh, this is my friend Cliff. Um, I want to tell a story about how I met Cliff because I think it's funny. Uh, Cliff has written three amazing books. I don't know if you've read them. The Comedians, Drunks, Thieves, Scoundrels, and the History of American Comedy is one of the 
if not the only greatest book on the history of comedy in this country, a great book. He wrote, We Had a Little Real Estate Problem, The Unheralded Story of Native Americans in Comedy, and this is the new book, Outrageous. But when I met Cliff, it was, what did you say, how long ago? Uh, well, 2010? 2010 is when this story takes So place. he used to write a column uh, for the WFMU Beware of the Blog. Uh, it was classic showbiz, and he wrote these articles, these pieces about classic you know, comedy. He wrote this amazing piece about Shecky Green and how you know, fucking insane he was. <laughs> and, but other things. It was, it was a nice piece, and, and, and Cliff really had a sense of the weird darkness that comedy comes out of in, in the entire history of comedy. I just thought that this was such an amazing thing about Shecky, about his genius, about his manic depression, about his chaotic behavior. And it inspired me to call Shecky Green, or to reach out, because I wanted to interview Shecky. So I try to track down Shecky Green. I've never met Cliff before. I try to track him down, and I find this single-page website, which is always a, a good indicator that <laughs> it's, it's run by the guy. So, and there's sort of like an info at SheckyGreen.com email. So I'm like, hi, uh, my name's Mark. I do a thing called a podcast. It's like a radio show. I'm really interested in having Shecky on. And like within a day, uh, I get a, an email back. Mr. Green uh, is willing to talk to you. And you know it's him writing that. <laughs> <laughs> you can call this number and, and maybe set this up. So I call a number. I don't know who I'm calling, but it's like, hello? And I'm like, oh, shit, it's Shecky Green. And I say, yeah, I, I'm, I'm Mark Maron. I wrote you the email, and I just wanted you to do this podcast so I could radio show. I would just come out there to Vegas or an interview. He's like, I'm not doing any more interviews. And I'm like, what do, you, what do you mean? He's like, that guy, who the hell wrote that thing? And I, I'd never talked to this guy before, but I knew he was talking about Cliff. <laughs> and I'm like, what, 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 what thing? I think I know what you're talking about. He's like, he didn't say anything about the charities or any of the good things I did. Who the hell wrote that thing? I'm not doing any more interviews. And I'm like, all right, well, I think I know who you're talking about. I was like, well, that's it. I'm not talking to anybody. And I'm like, then I, I look at the WFMU blog, and I find a contact for Cliff, who I've never met. And I said, hey, Cliff, I love your writing. I'm looking to interview Shecky Green. I, I just got off the phone with him, and he's very upset. Um, <laughs> he's, he's mad about a, an interview, that, or a piece of, and I'm pretty sure it was yours. And he just wants to know where you got that information and why you didn't ask him about the charities. So... <laughs> So I, basically, I said, hey, where'd you get that information? I wrote that. I wrote that to Cliff. And like right away, Cliff gets back to me and he says, he told me. That's right. That's absolutely right. Because <laughs> Shecky Green had left an angry message on my answering machine after I had published this article on the WFMU blog on the internet. And he said, uh, oh, Mr. Nestroff, I read that article you wrote in the paper. I'm very upset with you. Could you call me back, please? So... I phoned him back. I said, hey, Shecky, what's up? He goes, you wrote that article about me in the paper? I go, no, I, on the internet. He goes, yeah, 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 computer, right? <laughs> I go, yeah, on the computer. He goes, those stories you told about me and Buddy Hackett were terrible. Where, where, where did you get that shit? I go, Shecky, you told me. Yeah. He goes, I told you that? I go, yes, yes. He goes, well, next time you interview somebody, maybe you should record it. I said, Shecky, I recorded the whole thing. I just transcribed your words verbatim. He goes, oh, verbatim. <laughs> so anyways, and that's how Mark and I got to know each yeah. other. <laughs> and, that, and that's the kind of intense focus you have on the history of comedy. Yeah. But now let's talk about this book because I don't want to make this, you know, overtly political. And, and I, I know that people congregate at these type of events to, to find some hope. And, <laughs> <laughs> and I appreciate your desire for that. <laughs> now, this book is, is, is kind of amazing because I, I, I think we have had conversations on my podcast about what the incentive was. That you, him and I have had, you, you, we've had discussions about these people that are like, you can't say anything anymore. And we've always come to the, the reality that you can't say whatever you want yeah. if you're willing to shoulder the consequences. Yeah, absolutely. That this is not a constitutional issue these, these, most of these performers are talking about. But what I was kind of fascinated to find out, because I don't know history, I, I'm kind of uh, speculative and I know things, but you really, 
can, you really contextualize a, a very long history of different types of, you know, before culture wars were called culture wars, and there was, you know, real anger on behalf of communities, you, you know, pre, in the 1800s around entertainers. Like, I did not know any of that stuff about pre-vaudeville yeah. with the Irish community in this city. Yeah. That really it starts with a fairly democratic Im imperative of immigrant uh, class people wanting to sort of have a place in America as Americans and not wanting to be characterized as, as ethnic stereotypes in performances, and that was going on in the 1800s. Yeah, in the early days of vaudeville in the 1870s, 1880s, 1890s, ethnic characterizations and stereotypes were a predominant form of comedy on the vaudeville stage. You had Irish stereotypes, you know, leprechaun type shit. You had sure. Italian stereotypes, organ grinder type shit. Sure. You had blackface acts. You had uh, Dutch acts. You had what Dutch. The, yeah. Wow. You, uh, a lot, a lot of the stuff was sort of... What were those? Because I'm kind of curious. <laughs> <laughs> what was the hilarious Dutch stereotype? Well, was it? <laughs> they were mostly uh, moored in malapropisms, sort yeah. of like Borat, the confused oh, right, right. Sure. immigrant that of would flip the words. Of course, the confused Dutchman. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it was all that kind of stuff. And in, once uh, immigrants started to become a little more assimilated or started to have American-born children... Uh, a number of protest campaigns erupted to eliminate these depictions from the stage. And I'm talking very early on, the 1890s, an Irish group called the Clan Nagail organized. I think they were probably inspired a little bit by the Molly Maguires because they were very, very militant. I don't think they were connected to the Molly Maguires or the IRA in, in Ireland or anything like that, but similar aggressive tactics. They would write letters to Hammerstein's theater and say, you know, you've got two non-Irishmen on your show and they're doing Irish dialect and we find it insulting and you need to cut it out of the show. And Hammerstein would reply, well, people enjoy it and it's my theater and fuck <laughs> off, I'm not changing a thing. Yeah. And they said, well, if you don't, uh, things will happen. And he said, well, tough. And then things happened. Like what? The Clan Nagail would show up. They would blow whistles during the act, so it was drowned out. They would throw things at the stage. They would um, beat up comedians. They would send death threats, say, we're going we're gonna to cut you if yeah. you don't cut this out. And then later, in the, when silent movies started up, the Clan Nagail still existed. And when theaters showed silent movies that had Irish stereotypes, there was a... Uh, uh, Irish stereotype movie called The Callahans and the Murphys, which was sort of like a Hatfield and the McCoys type uh, film, they would storm the theater and throw black paint onto the movie screen and ruin the screen uh -huh. unless they pulled these movies. So that was very early on, and it did lead to the erosion of Irish stereotypes from the stage. Eventually, theater owners were like, okay, we're really paying the price yeah, here. No more leprechauns. Yeah, so they cut out the leprechauns. <laughs> This inspired other social protest movements with other minority groups. Italian Americans organized and fought against Italian stereotypes on the stage. African Americans organized. Native Americans organized. And it led to conflict, tension. There were editorials in newspapers that were supportive and that were condemning. Some editorials would say, well, if we buckle to these Irish protest groups, what's next? Black people won't let us do blackface? Think of the consequences. Yeah. And that How is. How are we going to be funny after that? There, there's an editorial I quote from in the book yeah. that's from 1904 that says that most comedy is based on the exaggeration of our differences. If we remove that from the stage, then say goodbye to comedy. But that's, so, that's hilarious because the exaggeration of our differences just meaning that why can't white people make fun of these other people? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's the exaggeration of differences. We don't have a, a, a stereotype, so why can't we just mock? Yeah, yeah, they often did argue in those papers that uh, these groups need to lighten up and get a sense of humor. <laughs> but don't you know? take off the blackface. Don't yeah, lighten yeah, up that much. Not that much, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, but, but what was interesting to me in, in the sort of evolution of these type of culture wars, that but culture war is a modern term, but yeah. it seems to me that what was going on then in vaudeville and just pre-vaudeville is, is similar to what we see now with marginalized groups, you know, fighting for a place in the culture that is respectful. Yeah. But in between, bookended in between this, is that 
because it, it seems to me that the Irish, the Italian, uh, the African American, the Jews fighting for this were really looking for their place in America. But shortly after that, it becomes a, a, a religious incentive. You know, when communism comes, you know, when when communism becomes a thing in Russia, that it shifts from being proactive in terms of marginalized groups fighting for their place in the country into just people claiming decency or claiming that things are anti-religious. Well, civil rights early on was considered a communist conspiracy. So there was this idea that if you were fighting for racial equality, you must be a dirty commie because the CPUSA in the 30s, they were the only major political party in America that was talking about that. Now, they may have been talking about it to exploit it right. for a specific reason rather than altruistic reasons, but they still were the only party that was even mentioning Jim Crow or lynching epidemics. And so that was attractive to a lot of people who were not communists who were interested in civil rights. So eventually, it just became a very convenient way to demonize anybody that was in favor of civil rights or racial equality. And so in the 1950s, the late 50s, and especially the early 1960s, uh, organizations like the John Birch Society would deride Dr. Martin Luther King. They'd say, well, he's probably a Soviet agent. If we pass the Civil Rights Act of 1964, it's going to lead to a communist dictatorship, a Soviet-style tyranny in the United States. It was a convenient way to demonize anybody who was in favor of racial equality. But, but how does this affect show business? Well, throughout that period, you had groups like the John Birch Society who... Um, would use that tactic to demonize that anything that kind of went against their belief system. So in those days, the John Birch Society actually protested Bob Newhart. That radical. Yeah. <laughs> that guy needs to be stopped immediately. Put the phone down, Bob. <laughs> Bob Newhart, some people know, was doing like monologues about American history, a phone call, you know, uh, with <laughs> Abraham Lincoln and whatever. In those days, it was taboo to do comedy about American history. It was considered sacred. Um, there were letters written to the editor complaining about an episode of Sergeant Bilko with Phil Silvers. Another radical. <laughs> Because they parodied uh, Washington crossing the Delaware. This was considered uh, the equivalent of being sacrilegious. But before that, you know, when Amos and Andy was the most popular show on radio, I mean, it took, it took I mean, how many years did it take for them, for the NAACP and for, for the black community to really Well, Amos and down? Andy was on the air for 30 years. 30 years? But it, had, it, it was different from the first season to the last season. Just like any show that's on the air for 30 years, whether it's SNL or The Simpsons, it looks different, feels different in different eras. So when it started, it was based on the minstrel conceit. In fact, the name Amos back in the 1800s was associated with slave tales, sort of like the Uncle Remus conceit. Yeah. Sambo is a famous name people know is associated with that era. So is Amos. So when Amos and Andy premiered, a lot of people knew that. And the theme song that Amos and Andy used when it premiered on radio was the theme music from D.W. Uh, Griffith's A Birth of a Nation. So it had all these sort of signifiers that there was this sort of racist conceit, this blackface conceit. And for those that don't know, it starred two white guys doing what they considered black dialect, performing a two-man act as Amos and Andy. Yeah. And it was protested one year after the show uh, went national. And the reason it became the number one comedy in America was not necessarily because everybody loved blackface dialect, but because of the format of the show. It aired five days a week, 15 minutes a day, with a cliffhanger at the end of each episode. And it conditioned people to tune in the next day. They wanted to know what was happening. You know, it was sort of like an early idea of uh, behind binge watching. You yeah. leave people wanting, they gotta know. So that's what made it popular. People had to keep tuning in to find sure. out what happened in the story. But the Pittsburgh Courier, one of the famous black newspapers of the era, organized a protest against it. They wrote several editorials saying, we're past this point now. Blackface belongs in the past. We don't need two white guys delivering uh, what they consider to be black dialect. Uh, this is an insult, and it shouldn't be on the air now that radio is becoming more and more a national pastime in every single living room, that this is harmful. And so there was 
literally thousands of letters written in support of this campaign. One letter which I quote from, which is from 1931, a black reader of the Pittsburgh Courier said that I consider Amos and Andy to be just as bad as the KKK. Another wrote that ever since Amos and Andy became popular, everywhere he goes, white people call him Amos or they call him Andy, the same way they would call black people boy, it turned into a slur. So there was great concern and they submitted a petition with close to one million signatures to the FCC, at the time it was called the FRC, Federal Radio Commission, demanding that they remove it from the air. But in those days, black radio listeners did not have much purchasing power. So the threat of a boycott of the sponsor did not have the same clout as if it were to come from white listeners. So their considerations were ignored and nothing changed. The show stayed on the air, the boycott campaign, which lasted, or not a boycott campaign, but a protest campaign, lasted for two years, but it didn't really uh, change things. The show stayed on the air. Eventually, it became more streamlined, became a half-hour sitcom. Uh, Charles Correll and Freeman Gosden, the guys who started it and created it, did hire some black actors for the radio show and an Asian actor. That was sort of like their concession, but they kept starring in it, doing this blackface dialect. But as radio became more popular and more comedy shows came to the air and there was more competition, it became less and less popular. It was still on the air. It's sort of like The Simpsons Because the still culture the changed. There was just more options. But I think it's a very interesting point you make about, uh, about corporate interests and, and purchasing power and how what we see now with uh, Christian nationalism and right-wing politics is, is this, uh, this idea that it's a moral basis, but it's always put in place to protect business, you know, that the culture wars in themselves are, are designed as a distraction. Because yeah. like uh, another example of that, which I, I can't get out of my head, was when the LGBTQ community was protesting Netflix because of Chappelle's special. And you know, ultimately what happened is Netflix didn't, didn't buckle and they didn't take it off the air because I think in their mind, not unlike these other, uh, like the, the black community's purchasing power, they realized there weren't enough voices to really stifle or choose. That, make. plus Netflix doesn't have commercials. So I think if that had aired on network television, it'd be very, very different because you have somebody to target who's the sponsor. But it also makes me lose. understand how like that business doesn't really give a shit about politics. Like, no. you know, how, like, what would it take for Netflix to become, you know, Reichflix? You know, like, you know, what, what, you know, what would have to happen? Not much, as yeah. long as... Well, it's interesting. Compare what happens in network television in the 1950s what, with what happens in the late 1960s, sort of the pre-civil rights movement and post-civil rights movement. In the 50s, network sponsors, ABC, CBS, NBC, if racists in the South complained about something and they had the purchasing power, they would change things or eliminate things in the script so as not to offend bigoted Southerners. After the Civil Rights Movement, they did the opposite. If things were considered offensive, offensive or odious to civil rights groups, they would change things and ignore the bigots. So there was a power change and corporations generally buckle to ha whoever has the most power at the time. So if it's an evangelical organization that has the most power, they're gonna koto to their demands. If it's a civil rights organization that has the most power, they'll koto to their demands. So um, it's, if you look at the 50s television, you weren't allowed to mention bigotry. Rod Serling tried to uh, write several dramas, one about Emmett Till, and the sponsor changed it. They said it can't take place in the South, it has to take place in the North, and it can't be about lynching, the guy has to steal from a cash register. You know, they just completely distorted the whole thing. Out of fear of losing. The sponsor didn't want a boycott campaign from bigots in the South who were happy that Emmett Till was murdered. Isn't it, that's, it, it, it seems in, insane and insensitive and wrong, but it, it still sort of happens. Yeah, that's how corporations make their decisions. It has God, nothing to do with ethics. Damn it. <laughs> Got any funny stories? <laughs> <laughs> Can talk more about Shecky Green. <laughs> but let's talk a, a minute about, like, not specifically anti-Semitism, but the impact, because, I mean, a big culture war, if we're going to frame it like that, you know, in terms of entertainment, was the McCarthy hearings, the Red Scare, and how that translated to, you know, what ultimately became the idea of a Jewish-run media. Mm -hmm. Is mm -hmm. that, do you, do you cover that? 
Well, in the 30s, Eddie Cantor got in trouble because he was probably the most well-known member, member of the Hollywood Anti-Nazi League. And he was campaigning for Jewish refugees before anybody else in America very early on, 1933, 34, 35. He hosted rallies around Los Angeles, let's help these Jewish refugees. His radio show was sponsored by Texaco. And they had internal memos where we said, we cannot let people think that Cantor has any political thoughts. We need to scale this back. And Eddie Cantor wasn't saying these things on his radio show. It was in his private life, but it was well known. And there was an incident where after a broadcast on CBS radio in front of the studio audience, they were off the air, and Eddie Cantor went directly to the studio audience and, and plead for, these, for uh, unity to fight against Hitler. Two people in the audience stood up and yelled, we don't want to hear any propaganda against Hitler. Bert Gordon, a comedian who was on the Eddie Cantor show, he was known as the Mad Russian, yeah. he had a catchphrase, how do you do? Yeah. That was his big catchphrase. Hilarious, I, but the Russians didn't get yeah, mad about yeah. that, right? They were just happy to be represented somehow. As, as these Nazi sympathizers were walking out of the show, Bert yeah. Gordon, the mad Russian, punched them, knocked them out, and it became a big scandal, a big news story. Anyways, the Eddie Cantor show was canceled by Texaco not uh, long thereafter. Six months later, the chairman of Texaco resigned in shame when it was exposed that he'd been secretly selling oil to the Nazis and was a Hitler sympathizer. So there was- Was he one of the guys that stood up? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. None of this anti-Hitler propaganda. Yeah. Something we hear today. Yeah. yeah. Um, sadly. Yeah. So as this moves forward, you know, in terms of controversy, I think an interesting turning point in the book is where you get these ex-John Birchers. You get, like, you know, I didn't realize, it because I, I, I don't, uh, and I think a, maybe I'm speaking for other people, but, but, like, I had no idea about the connections between, like, the Koch brothers and their father being yeah. one of the founders of the John Birch That's Society. Right. Yeah. And this thread of Bircherism that runs through the think tanks of today that actually, you, you, when you say culture war, that phrase was sort of invented you know, in relation to, you know, modern right-wing propagandizing, right? Yeah, there's this incredible lineage and family tree to this kind of stuff. And if you read John Birch Society propaganda from the late 50s and 60s, and it used to be made fun of all the time by Mad Magazine, one of George Carlin's first solo routines ridicules the John Birch Society, Bob Dylan had a famous song ridiculing them. They were a laughing stock. <clears throat> and if you read their materials, it's funny. Like, it's a camp classic. It's not meant to be funny. But there's a booklet that the John Birch Society distributed in the mid-60s called Communism, Hypnotism, and the Beatles. <laughs> and it's got a, a drawing of the Fab Four on the cover. And the, ar the uh, uh, pamphlet earnestly argues that the Beatles were sent here by Soviet Russia to destabilize American youth to make them weak need and prime for a communist takeover. Like, it seriously argued this. Um, but the John Birch Society was co-founded by the Koch brothers' father, Fred Koch, and a guy named Robert Welch, who was the guy responsible for Junior Mints. So if you eat Junior Mints, that's the anti-civil rights mint. <laughs> um, but... Their game plan, which was to deride the Civil Rights Movement, claimed that the Civil Rights Movement of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 65 would lead to tyranny, has this lineage that followed. And Charles Koch, one of the famous Koch brothers, ran a John Birch Society bookstore for three years until his father died and he inherited his wealth and changed the name to Koch Industries. It had been called like Winkler Koch Industries before that. And so he retained their political philosophy. The only thing he disagreed with, Charles Koch, about the John Birch Society was that they endorsed the Vietnam War and he was opposed. But he operated this bookstore when they were distributing books like Communism, Hypnotism, and the Beatles and other things that argued that Martin Luther King was a communist agent that had to be stopped. And when did this become, like, when did, how, how does this evolve into 
This, like, because I always associated the, the attack on rock and roll, mm -hmm. or, this would be pre-Beatles, as being religious organizations, but it wasn't just religious organizations. Well, there was always this sort of bigoted influence with Southern Baptists and a lot of evangelical culture, and a lot of the things that people hated about rock and roll is that a lot of the big musicians were black. Bo Diddley, Chuck Berry, and white kids loved them. And if you attended a rock concert, you often saw white kids and black kids dancing together, and this was considered a big no-no. So people from the pulpit would claim that you know rock and roll was the devil's music, but it was sort of code that it meant uh, quote unquote race mixing was the phrase that they always used at the time. And Elvis was like the, the sort of the combination of all forces. Elvis was, was considered like a white black guy, which was uh, terrible. There was a thing called the White Citizens Council um, that sprung up throughout the South. They were like Klansmen, but they wore suits. And they were sort of like the representatives, in my opinion, of think tanks today, like the Heritage Foundation. You have a guy in a bow tie. And that was the Koch brothers, right? Or was it uh, uh, They have connections with it. But the Heritage Foundation, you still see today, like on talk shows, somebody will be introduced, so-and-so is a senior fellow at the Heritage. Oh, senior fellow. That sounds smart. Like, <laughs> what the fuck is a senior fellow? Yeah. Nobody explains what that means. It's a guy the, in a, uh, the head racist. Yeah, a guy in a bow tie, <laughs> invoking the founding fathers, saying yeah. liberty and freedom over yeah. and over and over to sort of uh, give you the veneer of respectability when he's advocating for the repeal of all civil rights laws, all affirmative action laws, all women's rights laws. It's an illusion of scholarship. And so the White Citizens Council in the 50s was like that. Their nickname was the Uptown Clan yeah. because they wore suits. But they would picket Nat King Cole with uh, racist leaflets at his concerts out front that said, uh, Nat King Cole is coming for your white daughter and things like that. And at a gig in Birmingham, and Nat King Cole was apolitical. He wasn't a civil rights advocate. Four members of the Birmingham White Citizens Council stormed the stage and tore Nat King Cole from his piano and beat the shit out of him in front of the whole concert, broke his ribs, broke a cheekbone, and he was hospitalized, and he said, I don't understand it. Like, I'm not political. Why would they come after me? And the civil rights movement, while he was still ailing, criticized Nat King Cole. They said, that's the problem. Even though you're not active in the movement, they still hate you, you know? So get on board. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So all this pushback, this is, it's all the same forces, really. It's, it's, it's anti-communist, and then the religious faction is a decency thing. But then when you get into Lenny Bruce and the actual, where those arguments, when, when it, the controversy is really on the law books, as opposed to where we're at now, which is, people who say they can't say anything because of cancel culture or whatever reason, or offending a particular marginalized group. But there was a time, and they've sort of co-opted this as, as a, a beacon for them. But with Lenny, these were, these were obscenity laws that had to be dealt with and, and rethunk in relation to what the First Amendment means. But that yeah. not, has nothing to do with what's going on now, no. but it was a reality. Yeah, I find it insulting to Lenny Bruce when people say you can't say anything anymore because he literally was arrested, and several other comedians were. Mae West, I talk about in the book. She spent, that radical. Yeah, she spent 10 days in jail yeah. because she did a play called Sex. In, what uh, year the, was that? In 1928, I think, wow. 27, yeah. 28. It was called Sex, and it was successful. It ran for like six months until it was finally raided by the New York Vice Squad because of political pressure. They said, well, why are you letting this stand, even though it was very popular? They didn't just arrest Mae West. They arrested the entire cast and everybody there who was involved, the stage manager, the lighting director, the ticket taker, and they were all facing jail time. Ultimately, Mae West was convicted of obscenity. Usually the charge was staging an obscene show, and she spent 10 days in a prison workhouse. Lenny Bruce, in 1962, in liberal Hollywood, was arrested for using the word schmuck. He yeah. was arrested for By a bunch schmuck. of uh, schmucks. Yeah, by a bunch of schmucks. And so it's just an insult to say you can't say anything anymore when all of those obscenity laws, which held for so long, 
were overturned between 1964 and 1973. That was the key period when most obscenity laws were challenged and overturned, although some arrests still occurred afterwards, but the police would no longer charge you with uh, stage, staging an obscene show. They would come up with, uh, in the case of Richard Pryor, a charge like disorderly conduct. One of the cliches you hear today is, you, oh, you couldn't make blazing saddles today. You couldn't make blazing saddles today right. because of racial slurs. But in 1974, Blazing Saddles is released to theaters. It's a movie that's co-written by Richard Pryor. Right? It came out in January 74. It was still playing in theaters when Richard Pryor was performing in Virginia that summer, 1974. When he got off stage, he was arrested for disorderly conduct because he swore on stage. 1974, yeah. like that's pretty late in the game. Most people don't know that story. So these comedians made that ultimate sacrifice and I think we insult them every time we say, oh, you can't say anything anymore because there are slurs that are taboo today that weren't 20 years ago. Yeah, but also they, they, they've co-opted this position of grievance around uh, you know this freedom of speech business. But when you talk about prior where you talk about Lenny Bruce, even with the arrests for obscenity, obscenity and actual, you know, the idea that they broke the law is that, you know, Lenny and, and Richard Pryor, the, the reason they were doing what they were doing and what free speech meant to them, the, the objective was inclusivity. That the objective of Lenny Bruce with all the slurs of all the Well, that was always the great defense of Lenny Bruce from, you know, when, when people like Steve Allen, who loved Lenny Bruce, would defend him. They say, well, he's not being dirty for the sake of dirty. He's using these words to further a point. You know, he's not merely trying to be provocative. And today there's a whole genre of, of provocateur comedy where a guy will go up on stage, he'll say a word that he knows is going to get an ooh and an ah, says the word or the statement, it gets the ooh and the ah, and then the comic is like, what, 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 what? And he goes, you designed it to get that reaction, and well, now yeah, you're feigning this outrage. And you know? Yeah, yeah, ooh, am I going to get canceled now? You know, it's, but, but they, it's, 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 a, it's a false premise. It's a, it's a hackneyed idea, and what they're actually doing is, you know, co-opting this idea that they're free speech warriors, but they're actually fighting for the ability and the not the right, but the, the space to further marginalize people. Well, one words. thing I, I want everybody to remember, and yeah. it's never mentioned in uh, editorial social media, it's totally uh, perverted the way it's, it's characterized, is that a bigot on stage, and I don't mean a comedian, but like a bigoted speaker at a college arguing that black people aren't as intelligent as white people or whatever, Okay, they're exercising their right to free expression and to be a bigot. But when people object, when they protest that guy, they're not censoring that guy. They're practicing free expression to express their opposition to bigotry. Right. That's free expression too. Sure. And it's always mischaracterized in recent history as a, a willy-nilly naysayer, too sensitive, censorship. Yeah, but, but it's characterized that way in the bubble that they exist in. Yeah. There, yeah. There's, there, there's no real collective anymore. But, and, but it's two forms of free speech uh, pressing against each other. And if you're going to defend only the bigot and not the anti-bigot, like, who the fuck are you? What's wrong with I'll, you? I'll tell you who they are. It's half the country. Yeah. <laughs> but, but, yeah, but that's also a, a sort of a problem that I have with the idea that, you know, part of the, 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 the point of this book is that you know, this has always existed, that there, there was always this, this tension for whatever reason, whether it be proactive or, or, or uh, repressive. But I think now, because there, there are certainly more than three channels, not everyone's on the same page, people live in very alternate information realities, and now another part of the issue is that you know, information and news at some point, once the fairness doctrine was taken away, you know, has become entertainment. And, and, and I think a, a rational person can see that there's a big grift going on and that most of these guys are, are showboats and, and they're not really delivering anything but bullshit. Yeah. So like it becomes really hard to assess, 
you know, whether things are really the same or, or aren't very much worse. Well, you know, the whole think tank infrastructure and a lot of these foundations, and I talk about them in the book. I love that part of the book with Paul uh, Ry- Paul Weirich. And that, a lot that, of them have roots in the John Birch Society, the Bradley Foundation. Remember these names because once you are aware of them, you'll hear them all the time. They're always on social media, so-and-so from the Bradley Foundation, funded by the Bradley Foundation. What's the Bradley Foundation? They started as an electronics firm in Wisconsin. They funded the John Birch Society They by advertising in their newsletters in the late 1950s when they were called Allen Bradley. Um, they have co-opted the phrase free speech. They claim to fund free speech while sponsoring legislation that criminalizes protest. They're not free speech. They're anti-speech. Right. But the Bradley Foundation, the DeVos Foundation, the Charles Koch Foundation, the Scaife Foundation, they all have literally billions of dollars at their disposal, and they will fund a conservative group on a campus that's independent of the campus, that campus will then invite a provocative speaker that's funded by those foundations. A protest erupts in response to the speaker. The school is then sued by lawyers funded by that foundation. They film the protest, put it out into the ecosystem and say, see, this school's opposed to free speech and the media channels that are amplifying it are funded by those same think tanks and foundations. And people don't realize it, that it all stems from a handful of small groups that are very well organized, very well orchestrated, and are responsible for some of the great lunacy of the past several decades. And now what you're you're feeling is of 400 liberals going like, fuck, we gotta, (laughs) we really gotta get organized at some point. I think we, (laughs) is there any way we can, I don't know if we can push back on this or what. I mean, <laughs> we end up arguing about Israel for three hours. We're never going <laughs> to. Well, yeah, I mean, and this is totally relative to the premise of the book, which is entertainment, because the people you're talking about are the same people that characterized entertainers and tried to sort of harness the power you know, and maintain power in their base by using entertainers. I mean, the, like, as, I, like, as like I mentioned, scapegoats. the John Birch Society went after. Uh, Bob Newhart, Dick Gregory, George Carlin, The Beatles, um, many other things, All in the Family, Norman Lear. And all these years later, their lineage claims to be the champions of free speech. They're not. They never have been. Well, that's that's the interesting thing that you really explore in the book that that I'm I'm fascinated with, and it's hard for me to to sort of uh, pull it all together, is that a lot of the culture war points, the dividing points that become arguments among y- 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 the right and the left are designed to do that. And then you have comics of a certain ilk who will just take those talking points and, and run with them because they think it's a real issue yep. and that by talking about it, they're being provocative when actually they're just dupes for right-wing no. propaganda and easily appropriated yeah, by they've been manipulated. Politics. They've been manipulated. I have a little bit of sympathy for it because any of us are vulnerable to being manipulated. Not me, man. <laughs> I mean, the, the <laughs> in the in the old days when people complained, they wrote a letter to the editor. Yeah. And if say when the Smothers Brothers controversy happened in the late 1960s, and David Steinberg did these sermons, these mock sermons. And people said it was uh, ridiculing religion. How dare you put this on TV? CBS received hundreds, if not thousands, of angry letters. And as I mentioned in the introduction, some of them contained razor blades. Yeah. And So many Christians with so little to do. <laughs> <laughs> but today, you know, the key word uh, back then is editor. Letters to the editor. Sure. So if those letters, those angry complaints got published in a newspaper or TV guide, they published maybe one, maybe two, even if they received hundreds of letters. Today, there's no editor. Social media, they're all published instantaneously. It creates this illusion that people are now suddenly humorless, that they're more sensitive than in the past. But people had similar sensitivities in the past it's just people on the two opposing sides of uh, politics get upset for different reasons. Those of us on the left tend to get upset the most about bigotry, really. And that's what most of the, if you call it censorship, left-wing censorship is, is trying to suppress 
racism, racial slurs, gender slurs, and were characterized as anti-speech instead of anti-racist as a result. Well, that's where the, the language really plays a big part because we're, we're going to uh, run out of time here, but we'll take some questions in a second. But that they've perfected this propaganda because they are very organized and it's been going on a long time that you know, the, the idea of wokeism, generally speaking, you know, what does that even mean? It's this amazing umbrella term for everything the right has been pushing back or, or yeah, repressing. Whatever you don't like, yeah. Right, you know, it, and it, it, it just takes over everything and, and makes it a single uh, object-focused uh, yep. uh, ideology, which doesn't even mean anything, and now that's the big word. And what saddens me is there were guys, and or, well, I, one woman, Roseanne, there were, <laughs> you know, who were, you know, pretty amazing comic talents mm -hmm. who have sort of, you know, fallen for this idea that they're being, you know, muscled right. to not be able to express themselves. Now, obviously, there is a sensitivity, but I, I tend to believe that these type of, of reactions around being triggered and around, you know, and then again, I'm not on a college campus or in a, right. in a work right. environment where, where it's volatile. Right. Right. But eventually, you know, once people have said their piece, and, and, you know, it's out in the culture and, and it's known, uh, it, it'll contract and, and they'll find a place. Mm -hmm. But the problem now is that, you know, tolerance is not necessary in a totally polarized culture. Like, they're, they're, if, without tolerance, without the idea with, with the majority, you know, if the majority decides something in a democracy, then the people in the minority have to suck it up they may be against it initially and be like, you know, fuck that. But you know, after a few years, they're like, nah, I guess it's all right. But now, that doesn't even exist. So intolerance, without tolerance, democracy can't really function. And I just see this as a, as a two-sided thing, that it's not only tribal, but there's an entire point of view that refuses to budge on, on any sort of uh, in inclusivity or tolerance for what the majority might want. And that's why we're headed towards, here comes the hope. Uh, a, a very real fascism, and <laughs> and uh, and and I don't know what the position is for progressive comedy and and progressive you know uh, you know art in entertainment. It exists, but you know, is it toothless? I don't know why I'm asking you this. This is just something I think about every waking minute <laughs> of my life. This means, well, why don't we just take some questions? Um, <laughs> you, do you got an answer for that? You just want to hit these? No, we'll, we'll hit these questions. <laughs> but I, I did want to just say that, you know, freedom's a good thing. Liberty is a good thing. But when somebody uses the phrase freedom and liberty every single time they appear on TV, be skeptical of that motherfucker. Not necessarily. Also in this book, there's some great... Uh, Zappa stuff like you know I don't know if you're really aware just how prescient that guy was about what's happening here because you do go into yeah. those Senate hearings yeah, around PMRC the, and yeah and like it's it's really all in here and it's it's almost hard to talk about in this short of time because you know Cliff's uh, ability as a historian and as a a thorough uh, nerd for show business is to make it very engaging and, and also sort of create this story and make these connections that are ultimately surprising. I know there's four people in this room through this entire conversation that sat there going like, yep. Um, but there's only four. And, and most of us don't know this stuff and you put it together in a beautiful way. It's a beautiful book. Thank you, yeah. thank you. Oh, this one just says, when's the Jew going to shut up? <laughs> um, I, you're not supposed to give me the weird ones. Okay. All right. When do you think the public will get tired of this wave of faux edgy comics whose sole appeal is that they are punching down an anti-woke? Oh, I can answer that. Um, Again, speaking to the issue of complete polarization is that, you know, there was a time where, where they would eventually 
have a hard time getting work, or as Cliff noted, eventually the culture would move on. But I feel that because of the polarization, because of the bubbles, that they will find their market. Yeah. And, and because of social media platforms, be able to fill rooms with people that will pay to see them for as long as this, this polarization exists. Well, people like to hear their point of view reinforced. So that just, uh, you know. So never. <laughs> And, and unfortunately, you just have to choose not to listen to it and hope they don't stifle other voices entirely. Again, a lot of hope. Can you talk about the history of comedians choosing to stir outrage to get rich and famous and how even Matt Reif is now symbolic of that? Well, first of all, like, don't jump the gun on Matt Reif. Uh, if you don't know who he is, he's the, 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 the new it boy of shitty comedy. And... <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and you know he's he's taken a big chance in his career right now to uh, to to shit on the mostly female audience that he uh, accumulated through uh, social media to sort of you know kiss up to uh, these uh, these uh, pseudo edge lords and you know personally I don't think it's going to go well for him. Um, <laughs> And ultimately, my producer, Brendan McDonald, the genius, made a good point uh, in saying that I, he thinks that Matt Reif is, is actually mobilizing a new generation of comics to push back against what that stands for in, in much the way that Dane Cook did at a different time yeah. to, to once again you know, be creative and, and bring a new energy and voice to what that doesn't represent. So maybe within show business, there is hope. I read an interesting interview uh, several years ago when Matt Reif was maybe five or six years in. His mother took him to see Dane Cook when he was six years old. I'm not joking. And he said, I want oh, to Oh, so he's that. a victim now. <laughs> <laughs> he has a, a righteous grievance. <laughs> but it's comparable. It's the same uh, kind of thing. Now, I forget this is going out on the uh, internet now. And I'm, I'm fucking... Now I'm going to have to deal with Dane calling me. Hey, dude, I thought we were good. Um, hey, look, we're all in the same business. We're just trying to entertain people. <laughs> okay, uh, let's see. What does it say? What does it say? What does it say? Does the ability to generate a private income stream, e.g. via Patreon, give today's... Cons okay, let me... Let, there's many commas in this question. <laughs> And it was written very deliberately. Does the ability to generate a private income uh, stream, e.g. Uh, via Patreon, give today's conservative reactionaries more power than those in the past? Yes. <laughs> it gives them not, a, not only just, just these uh, 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 conservative reactionaries, but comics and everybody. And, and with conservative reactionaries, and this is just my speculative point of view, that if, if the algorithms are driving you down these rabbit holes, it seems like you can radicalize someone within 48 hours uh, if they're diligently interested in what's being presented to them by their last uh, search. You agree? Man, I'm so depressed. I don't here. need to. <laughs> Do either of you have a good Don Rickles story? I have two barely stories that I'd like to share. Which ones? Barely? Well, they're barely stories. stories. They're barely stories. But I was booked to do a show with Don Rickles in Las Vegas. They booked us for some festival. The mayor of Vegas was going to moderate it. Yeah. It was supposed to be about comedians and the mafia. And if you read Don Rickles' memoir, which he didn't write, it was ghostwritten, but if you read it, he doesn't mention the mob in relation to himself, only in relation to Frank Sinatra. But as I wrote in my first book, the mob took over his career at one point. Rickles, Anyways, Rickles' career. Yeah. Anyways, yeah. we were supposed to do this show together, and uh, Rickles was going to dish. You know, He was going to tell the reality, and we signed the contracts, and then he died. <laughs> so I have, uh, I don't know if it was the mob, but... <laughs> It was one of those amazing instances where the mob killed somebody of old age. Yeah. <laughs> they were very clever, you know, back then. But then, after he died, they had a Don Rickles estate sale, and one of the listings was Don Rickles' book collection, 
and it was a picture of my book, The Comedians, being sold in the Don Rickles <laughs> estate sale. So I kind of like that, you know. <laughs> Anyways. It's so funny to watch, like, because I go on these things where I just start watching, uh, like, for some reason I was watching a lot of Don Rickles uh, segments on Carson and yeah. stuff, and also Rodney Dangerfield. Yeah, the best. You know, the, yeah, and uh, well, there's, there's no better story than to watch Sinatra or Rickles tell that story about their first meeting. Yeah. But also, like, the amazing thing about Rickles is just, you know, how much he didn't make sense at all. <laughs> that... <laughs> You know, he was known for this thing, but if you, if you just go on YouTube and watch a lot of those old clips, he just starts saying things, and it's the timing, mm -hmm. you know, where, you know, he'd be yeah. like, what are you, what did, what did that come with, two pairs of pants and a hockey puck? And you're like, what does that even mean? Yeah, but yeah. You're, you're just sort of like, oh, my God, that's hilarious. Yeah. But you're not supposed to think about it later. You just live in the moment. Yeah. But, but also... Like, I didn't realize because, you know, just how much dead air there were on talk shows back in the yeah, day because yeah. they went on forever. Yeah. And just like, I don't know if you noticed it about Rickles, and I, and I love Rickles, but the amazing thing about Rickles is, like, he was a drowning man from the get-go. He would sit in that chair next to Carson and just be flailing out of the gate. Yeah. And, and like, just like, you know, like sweating and saying things that made no sense yeah. with that amazing yeah. timing. Yeah. yeah. And every once in a while, you'd be like, oh, my God, this doesn't make any sense. And he's bombing, but yeah. you, you love it. So, so, so Some of the best Rickles stuff is not available that he did on Carson. There's a week that uh, has been digitized. Carson Entertainment has a massive archive of every Johnny Carson show that survives. They don't digitize the ones with guest hosts, but they did digitize a week of shows guest hosted by Don Rickles. Yeah. And he doesn't do an opening monologue. He just immediately goes out into the audience after they play the theme song and starts insulting the audience. Yeah. And he does it for 10 minutes, and he did it five nights in a row, and it's amazing. <laughs> it's like at his height, 73, 74, so hopefully one day the public can see it. Didn't but. Judd just make a, 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 a documentary? Yes, he made about a mini short film about the relationship between Bob Newhart and Don Rickles and their lifelong friendship, and it's really good. It's really sweet. It's 20 minutes long. Michael uh, Bafiglio, the co-director of the George Carlin documentary that Judd produced, uh, put it together, and you can see that on uh, the New Yorker website. Yeah, it's fun to watch those old guys. You, it, you know, it's also fun is to watch when Rodney Dangerfield does panel on Carson, and there's a couple where he, because Rodney would only do his jokes and he right. never talked. Right. Do you know that one where he runs out of material and yeah, there's and still just, time left? <laughs> yeah. and, and Carson's like, "That's it, honey." He's like, "Yeah, honey, that's it." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. There seems to be a generational clash or feeling of opposition and competition between generations, e.g., a lot of e.g.s. Um, uh, boomer slash Gen X slash Millennial slash Gen Z. Is this a continuation of historical trends or something new? Yeah. That's a, I, I mean, I can only answer that in a speculative uh, way. Um, I, don't, I don't know that it's, I think it seems to happen quicker, and as each generation comes, in some ways, the expectation and perhaps the quality starts to degenerate I mean, a, a little I, bit. I think it is the same. You see the phenomenon. But I'm an old guy now, so I say see, things like that. But you These see, kids. You see that fun. phenomenon with comedians themselves. I have several examples in the book, sort of an arc of Mae West, Steve Allen, Billy Wilder. They, they start out being the firebrands who are condemned sure. for being... Uh, May, May West for being dirty. Billy Wilder did a movie that was condemned by the, the Catholic Legion of Decency. Steve Allen was targeted with death threats by the John Birch Society. As they get older, they start to turn. Mm -hmm. And Steve Allen, who was uh, one of the funniest, wittiest, great champions of comedy, became very conservative as he got older and started to condemn comedy. And before he died, he wrote his last book. It's called Vulgarians at the Gate, and it's a bit of a camp classic. In the book, he condemns the David Spade sitcom Just Shoot Me and Dawson's Creek and says they're leading to the downfall of America. And I think the point is here, these, these guys just have to die sooner. <laughs> We're singing with Bill Maher now. It, it's...
Again, I'm going to be fielding calls and probably some <laughs> tweets that I'm not going to... That doesn't matter. <laughs> but I, something happens to, to some people when they get older. I don't know what it is. Even my father, who's uh, mildly demented at this point, is saying things where I'm like, where did that come from? He's like, I, I don't know. <laughs> so yeah. I, I don't know what it is. Maybe a, a person can explain that to me. But it does seem to happen... To a lot of people. It happens free, frequently. And Mae West, the same thing. You know, she was the scourge of uh, church groups and, and decency, decency organizations. By the 1970s, she said, movies are too dirty. I don't like hearing swear words. I don't like dirty jokes told in my presence. Martha Ray, I have a quote from her in the book, who uh. she was a big comedy star in the 1930s and 40s. She goes, I hate comedy today. It's all dirty and putting down the president. I can't stand any of these comedians. Eddie Murphy, David Letterman, Steve Martin. They're all disgusting to me. <laughs> and then she sued David Letterman because Martha Ray, some people remember in the 80s, she became a spokesperson for polydent denture cream. Yeah. And she would be on the commercial and at the bottom of the screen it would say, Martha Ray denture wearer and so David Letterman on late night did this monologue joke where he said Paul I saw the most terrifying commercial last night and Paul Schaefer is like yeah yeah what's that and Letterman goes it said Martha Ray condom user and so Martha Ray sued NBC and Late Night with David Letterman for defamation of character, and this is true, her legal counsel qualified and said, Martha Ray, in fact, is not a condom user. <laughs> it's true. The, the thought that comes to my head is, is odd, but like, you know, if being an entertainer or, or being a comic or being a dirty comic in some respect, and I'm talking about myself, is some kind of, you know, fuck you to either to the generation that became, came before you or to your parents, that I guess maybe uh, eventually grow out of that, and that might happen when you're 80, and you realize, like, I'm not mad at them, and they were right. I mean, it's a really common cycle throughout the history of America. But to speak business. to this more directly, I think there's always been generations, and I speak of it, you know, I feel like that there are generations of comedy. You know, there are the old guys, and then there were the, the new guys in the 70s that are very defined on the cultural landscape. And then there's the generation right before me, which was the comedy club boom generation. And then there was, you know, my generation. And, and, and you can sort of differentiate between them. And I think that always... Uh, another book, what's that book? And you wrote about it too. The amazing thing about the comedians is that what we don't realize is that at any given point in time where you know the 10 comedians that are popular, there's literally a thousand that no one fucking knows about. And, and I think it's the same generationally now that whether the platforms or whether it's TikTok or, or whatever, a lot, there are a lot of more comics and a lot more visibility and you can get content out there that'll put you on the radar. But in order to sustain a career in show business, you must be able to do the job. And the nature of that job doesn't seem to really change that much. But I do think that it is different. And, and I think that ultimately what happens that is sad is that when I see these younger comics or comics a couple generations from me, and they think they're doing something amazingly new, it's really not. Uh, and they think they're inventing it, and I guess every generation does that, but I, I think there's hope in that. It seems that true artists and true comics and, and people that really have something to say and are creative generally surface in, in a big way. Uh, so I think that's optimistic, uh, right? <laughs> Do you feel uh, satisfied with this conversation, Cliff? Hold on. Uh, oh, what? Uh, here we go, uh, and then we'll we'll we'll, we'll wrap it up because I, I know it's a library, and you know people have to get home. What advice would you have for an emerging comic voice? Well, this could have been a little funnier. Um, <laughs> Here, th this. <laughs> All right, this is the last one. All right, let's Where do does political comedy, specifically late night television, fit into this conversation? Carson was known for being apolitical. Present day is near, uh, near singly focused. Well, some of them. 
uh, well, that's interesting because there was a time where they were very apolitical, but I think that uh, you know Trump sort of changed that in, in terms of really picking sides, except for for Jimmy Fallon, who, and I'm not taking any shots at him. I think he's very fun and, and it's a fun show to do. No. But what do you think? Who cares? Good answer. <laughs> well, look. <laughs> Where does it fit into the conversation? I, I think this is, you, well, it, it's interesting because it does fit in a little bit in terms of when you talked about Eddie Cantor and how this was not a person that was political in public. No, for, and, for years and years, political comedy... Uh, was taboo. There was Will Rogers and there was Bob Hope, but it was very generalized. They didn't talk about specific uh, policies. They didn't talk about uh, legislation specifically. It was in a general way. And if you look at Bob Hope's jokes in the 30s and 40s, he would say something about the Democrats and get a laugh. He would say something about the Republicans and get a laugh. But the exact same joke, you could remove the word Democrat with Republican and it's the same joke. Well, it wasn't about anything and well, most one of the reasons was because for most of the 20th century criticism of politics outside of uh, a news organization was forbidden you weren't allowed to do that in show business you would have been stopped you would have been censored certainly not on Steve Allen's Tonight Show or Jack Parr's Tonight Show did they permit it until the early 60s when people like Dick Gregory started to change it a little bit Mort Saul of course changed it a little bit but um, ultimately, sponsors frowned upon that thing because, again, it felt like they were going to polarize or, or uh, um, uh, alienate po possible purchasers of their products. Well, I think all that's changed. I mean, I think this question is, is um, you know, he's talking about the history of it, which is in the book. But, I mean, The Daily Show and political satire shows certainly, you know, opened the door for, you know, for hosts to have an opinion and if they were funny and, and I, uh, to, to get that opinion out there and, and certainly you know, help move, you know, the cultural ball in the right direction. So I, I think that they're probably, you know, found freedom in that and are now taking the, the liberty to have opinions. And I, I mean, I don't know whether it fits in or how it fits in, but, uh, you know, I think if it's funny, it's funny. And if it's, if it's, what am I trying to say? I don't know. I stopped listening. The, uh, I only got through half the book. The, um, <laughs> I read the whole book. Thanks a lot, folks. You're great. Thank you. Cliff Nesterov. He's signing books over there.